welcome to this Darwin Today podcast from Research Councils UK. I'm Jeremy Pritchard from the University of Birmingham. In this podcast, we'll be considering how the process of evolution can be used to understand society. The process of evolution can be used to understand things such as the development of the dinosaurs, but it can also be applied to diverse things such as learning, social hierarchies, and even language. The possession of language by humans can be seen as an adaptation which increases our fitness, but we can also use the rules of evolution to understand the development of language. So, first off, language. How do humans manage to rapidly learn and understand their native language? Uh, with me now is Nick Chater, who's been studying the evolution of language. Hi, Nick. Hello. Uh, some people have argued that the brain's evolved by natural selection to develop a mechanism for language acquisition, uh, and that we can contain a sort of hardwired, innate, biologically determined universal grammar. But you, you disagree with that interpretation, Nick? Yes, uh, many of the people who argue for universal grammar think of themselves as the Natu natural heirs of the Darwinian perspective, merely applied to the evolution of the aspects of the brain that, uh, that deal with language. But in fact, Darwin himself takes a different line. His view, expressed in The Sense of Man, is that language itself should be viewed as analogous to an organism which transmits itself via, le via learning from generation to generation and is continually changing and evolving. And from that perspective, one wants to see not so much the brain as evolving, but uh, and evolving as a particular universal grammar, but language itself as the evolving part of the system. Right, so, so a language then should be seen like an organism with the same attributes of variation, inheritance and uh, differential survival that we see in a dinosaur or something. Absolutely, and the, for language the critical um, determinant of whether a particular form or aspect of the language becomes propagated becomes, uh, becomes widespread, is not, of course, survival in the, the classical biological sense, but it's the ability to propagate from one individual to another. So essentially, learnability and the naturalness of a particular linguistic form in processing. So if I find something easy to learn and I find it useful to say, then that will become part of my language, and then that will, dis will modify the linguistic input to my children, people around me, and you get a fairly rapid cultural change. So that's a cultural change, but without a genetic basis. That's right. The genetic basis is the same genetic basis that underpins other cultural behaviours. We have a, an extremely flexible brain with many hardwired features for perception and motor control, and those will impact the kind of um, mm. the processes that we can use to process speech and also to produce speech, which is a very complicated motor control activity. But those processes are not specific to language. Right, right. So you argue that this evolutionary process could also be applied to other cultural activities? Yes, I think the same basic principle applies across culture. So because cultural activities change very rapidly, language being actually relatively slow in changing, then it's extremely unlikely that for any uh, culturally uh, created um, structure, that that will provide a stable platform for biological evolution. To, to, to the extent you see a match between the cultural form and uh, our brains, i.e. It's, it's particularly natural for us to learn or particularly natural for us to use, then I think the f first place you should look in terms of understanding that is thinking of natural selection applying to the cultural form. Mm, so the two processes of biological evolution and cultural evolution have a very different time frame. Exactly. And that's what makes the idea that the, there is a, a real co-evolution between those processes implausible. Mm. You can't have one without the other. You can't have one without the other, but the change, once you have the biological machinery, the brain power, as it were, in place to create language and other cultural structures, then those structures are going to be determined primarily mm. by, by the biological structure, rather than feeding back extremely rapidly mm. um, to build a brain which is especially designed for these types of languages, these kinds of um, social structures and so on. So your work now is really throwing light on the, th the suggestions that Darwin originally made about applying his ideas to something quite radically different than the, the biological... Indeed, theory. and in fact, Darwin's, uh, one, of, one of Darwin's many inspirations for the theory of evolution was um, philology. So the study of the history of languages, where the idea of variation and selection was at a fairly uh, broad, intuitive level, being widely described in the early 19th century and beyond. So, in a way, to, to a small but significant degree, some of the inspiration for the 
biological theory of natural selection came from mm -hmm. thinking about language, and I think that now reflects back mm -hmm. in a much more, more rigorous uh, set of theoretical ideas for understanding how language itself changes. In fact, both evolution of language and biological evolution inform each other. Well, that's, that's really interesting, Nick. Thanks for that. We've just heard how evolutionary theory can be applied to languages. With me now is Edward Cartwright, who's applying Darwin's theories to leadership in groups. Hi, Edward. Hi. So what sort of groups are we talking about? Um, social groups. I'm primarily interested in humans. Um, so in modern day society, that could be um, groups of friends, or it could be businesses, or you know, any sort of uh, group of humans. OK, and how, how important is leadership to the success of these groups? Uh, it's very important. In, groups often require a collective action problems, so that means they need to work together um, to solve tasks. And the leader can be important in two respects. First of all, to decide what the group should do, so he makes the decision. And secondly, he can then coordinate the people in the group so that they work together uh, to achieve the outcome. So on. Okay, so, so the, the attributes of the leader permeate the group and give the group certain characteristics which make it more successful than another group which doesn't have those characteristics. Yes, I mean, basically, if the leader can make the group work together um, collectively, then they can do better than other groups. So, in fact, as, as Darwin talked about, there's differential survival of the groups, so there's a selection process going on there. Yes, groups with, with good leadership um, who can achieve, who can collectively work together should do better than mm -hmm. other groups and, and um, you know, succeed. Right. And to push the analogy with natural selection a little bit further, um, where, where does that variation come from? In, in from mutation, but clearly in groups that, uh, of people, that's not going to be the case. Yeah, but there's, there's lots of grounds for variability. First of all, the, the leader um, will have certain traits like um, ambition or persuasiveness or empathy. And also the other people in the group who are the followers have to be willing to accept um, and work with the leader. Yeah. And so there's variability both in the leader and in the people who follow him. And so, you know. And the success of this group might then lead to the group reproducing, if we stretch the analogy even further, maybe splitting into two groups or something. So. Yeah, I mean, a successful group will succeed, and, and then it might split yeah. into two groups. And if they maintain the, the right leadership qualities that the first group had, you know, it can spread and those types of groups will succeed. So you have the three tenets of a natural selection theory there. You have variation, inheritance, and, uh, and a differential survival. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so are there any other crossovers between uh, the way that you analyse groups and the way that biologists use? Are there any other areas of common uh, interest? Um, well, my personal interest is in game theory, and, and we're using um, you know, game theory to try and understand how this, this leadership and also the followership can emerge. Um, in these group settings. Excellent. So, so as well as the, as the general principles, in fact, biologists using game theory to understand animal behaviour also is relevant to, to what goes on in, in, in these type of groups. Yeah. Great. Well, that's really interesting. Thanks very much for your time, Edward. Okay. Thank you. Just, we've heard about how evolutionary theories can be used to understand social issues. To learn more about how Darwin's ideas can be used to understand economic and social sciences and to comment on these issues, go to our website darwin.rcuk.ac.uk.